A new customer of mine named Rick just bought his dream guitar, a brand new 2021 Martin D45. A D45 is the high end of the Martin line, loaded with beautiful abalone inlay work. Both sides of the binding, down around the heel, all the way around the fingerboard, that's my favorite part. The sound hole, the fretboard, and it has CF Martin and abalone on the peg head. It's gorgeous, but there's one thing he doesn't like about it. It's the inlay at the third fret. He said, Dan, it's just too dark. I waited so long for this guitar, I just want it perfect. So he's asked me if I would pull that on and replace it. Well, I'd never turn down working on a D45. It's not that hard a job to do, but it does take a good eye and a real attention to detail. So let's walk through this step by step and see if we can't make this almost perfect D45 perfect for Rick. Abalone has been used for centuries as an inlay material. An abalone shell looks like this. This is what you'd see down there in the ocean if you were diving for it. It's like you put all the color down and stirred it and you got the swirl patterns like a rainbow. These are very old. They belong to my wife's great grandmother. Another material that's often used for inlay work is abalam. It's small pieces of real abalone compressed into a matrix and you really can't hardly tell it from the real thing. See how that blends in? But there's tiny little lines here. Abalam is nice to work with because it's perfectly flat. Real abalone slabs can vary a bit in thickness. This Martin here has, to my eye, real abalone in all the stripes going around the edge. Definitely on the inlaid Martin and the peg head. On the fretboard though, some are abalone and some are abalam. Abalam, abalam, I can see the little lines. Abalone, hard to tell. Abalone, abalam. Abalam, and I'm gonna call it Abalam. At Stumac, we sell packets of real abalone like that, and we sell blanks of Abalam. Now I have to decide what piece I'm gonna to use to replace the inlay. Looking through these, I like this one, because it has that fluorescent red in it, and it almost seems like every other inlay has that pinkish quality to it. Pinkish, more green. Pink, green, pink, green. So I am going to put this there because it'll really show up. I'm going to get that pink right in it. Before I take the inlay out, I want to make a little template of it. I'll use a clear plastic pick guard that I had laying around the shop. That should do it. I'm going to tape it down. I'm going to take an inlay scribe. On every sharp corner, I'm going to make a mark. I'll have a cavity when I'm done. And another thing I can do is put a piece of tape or paper on that hollow cavity and rub a pencil on it. You know that old trick and it'll take the image. So now we're gonna cut out this hexagon. First, I just need to connect these dots. Just wanna throw those dots in with a little black. Just make them a little easier to see. This is not the way, it's just a way. You could draw this out on a computer and print it out early in my career, my chip carving knife rolled off the bench and it fell that way and I caught it with my legs and I jammed it up to the hilt right there. And I pulled it out and bled like crazy and finished getting the binding on and then my wife took me to St. Joe's Hospital and I got it stitched up. Ruined a good pair of boots. Okay, now I've got the template. Now let's take this dark inlay out. So what I'll do here is drill Two holes in here, one on each towards the end because there's a truss rod in here. This will probably make you cringe. Me drilling into a D45. Sort of sacrilegious, you know. There's a little bit of ebony, so I'm down in there. There's a little bit. That's just a little piece of wet felt transfer the heat really fast. And this is not the regular soldering station that, that I would use for electronic work. It's a 100 watt with a big wide tip, so it's got a lot of surface area. Let's hope everything goes right. I'll go ahead and heat this thing up.
Remember, I don't care what happens to this piece. I'm coming in with the drill bit I use for the two holes. It's my little pry bar to get it out. It's not coming. Let's put a lot more heat on it, right on the abalam surface. This could be super glue, it could be epoxy. Heat will break all those down. If it doesn't come out, I'll get my Dremel tool out and I'll route it out. This stuff's just gonna come apart like a piece of fudge or something. So, I'm gonna quit there. I don't like it. I'm gonna get out my Dremel tool. So I'm going to use this miniature plunge router Plunging down into the holes that I drilled, or just one really as an entrance. Back in my home shop, I have a vacuum that I modified with a smaller hose at the end so I can hold it and suck up the dust while I drill. But this vacuum is a little bit bigger, so maybe uh, the video crew can help me out. I'll help you. <laughs> with safety in mind, I'm going to definitely wear this. You don't want to breathe pearl dust. Teamwork. One short break here. I'm going to put down some tape along the border here. It'll give me a much better view of where I don't want to get close to with my router. Now I can see my path a little more clearly. Now we'll see if that'll break loose a little more freely. I left pearl all along the edges here, hoping that just the chisel tap would chip it out, but it's bonded in there pretty well. I think if I heat it now, I'm just going to come out there with the soldering iron. Yeah. A piece of pearl holds its shape and its form, it gets hot, and it lets go. This is like taking out epoxy all the way to the bottom. I think I can take this off now, get a better look at what I'm doing. One thing I can say I've learned here is that abalam doesn't come out easy. If this was pearl, I'd pry it right out. I want to clean this up a little bit if I can get a little bit more glue off of there. And I poured a little bit of acetone into a little mixing cup. What I like to do is drop a little half inch repair magnet on it and set it on anything steel on my bench so I won't be tipping it over. You wouldn't want to get acetone on the binding or the finish. That's just fine. Next, I'd like to know how deep this cavity is compared to the thickness of the abalone. First, let's measure the abalone. 49 thousandths. Then using the depth stop function on the calipers, I'll measure the depth of the cavity. 52 thousandths. Gosh, that's so close in size. The cavity is just the slightest bit deeper. So I'm ready to cut this because if we can get a good shape on this, it'll drop right in. And then if it's too low, I'll put probably thin pieces of paper under it to shim it up when I glue it in. I want to decide which part of this pearl would look best in there and then use this to trace around it. I kind of would like to go with this piece running lengthwise. It's kind of symmetrical and it sort of matches this one. See these little curves? This one has little curves too. So I'd like to keep that in the piece. I'm gonna run this right up to the edge. I'm gonna go a little bit beyond. So I'm gonna take my little template, which fits pretty good by the way, but it's not perfect. When it's in, it leaves about 12 thousandths of a gap up here, and it tapers on a gap here. Of course, I'll be sure to take that into account when I trace and cut the abalone blank.
I'm going to take the hex and put it up to the front edge of that blank, which is pretty straight and square, and then mark it with a pen. I'm going to add to this side a little bit, go from zero to about 12,000. So I'm going to add a little pearl on each side, and I think I'll have a pretty good shape. This is a pearl cutting saw. It's a frame saw, like a coping saw. We have extra fine, fine and medium blades. I chose fine. I practiced a piece early and it worked well. I've got a short stool here to sit on and it really supports the weight evenly. And I have a board clamped here. It's a little jig fixture to cut pearl against. And it's made for one of these. This is what we sell here. You can attach an air pump to it and it will lightly blow the dust away as you cut. If you use that, be sure to wear a respirator. You don't want to be breathing pearl dust. I'm not going to use this one today because I'm going to use this one that Craig Lavin made when he shot our pearl inlay video. You'll want to see that if you're getting into pearl cutting because he is a master. I'm going to start here and go to the corner and then turn the pearl and turn the saw and cut that way. This I just want a straight line, straight as I can get it, going down to the corner. You can see why that little blower comes in handy. I'm turning the blade a little bit. I'm sawing a little circle to give me a little room to turn that blade around when I change the cut. This is the last cut. I'm making it with one blade. There we have it. It's going to be a pretty one. See, we stayed outside the lines and that gives us some breathing room to shape it in. We'll see how it fits first by getting the guitar back out and seeing where we need to trim. What I've done here is taken the inlay and set it carefully over the routed area until I can't see any of that cavity down there. And then I held it down very carefully because it's going to want to slide just by touching it. And then ever so carefully came in and laid tape on all the sides. And now I have a pretty good idea of where the inlay is hanging over the cavity. Got to take a lot off this wall, a good deal off that wall, a fair amount off this and that. This one's pretty close. And this one's close. So now to bring this down to size, you have several options. You can use files, sandpaper on a flat surface, double stick down, or if you have a belt sander, that's the fastest way, and that's what I'm going to do. I put a little piece of double stick tape on the top of this so it, my finger can grip it. It's my little handle, and I'm going to approach these two black lines and then go test. This is a much bigger sander than I need for this job, but I'll try my best to be really careful. That's fitting pretty good back here. Now I'm going to take more off and work on this corner. I took the tape off because these two edges are fitting quite well and so is the back side. I just want to take off where it's not fitting now. I'm going to take off on that side right there. From this point on, it's just a matter of back and forth. Sand a little bit and test, sand and test, until you get it just right. Take your time and test fit often. Well, that's almost a perfect fit. With that big sander, it went a little bit too far and there's a little gap over on this side. But we'll take care of that later with a little, uh, little old Dan's Magic. Don't worry about the leftover black marker because that will come off in the next step.
And I'm about ready to glue the inlay in, but before I can do that, I've got to radius the top of the blank because the fretboard's curved this way. And a pearl blank is flat. You can't put a flat blank in on a curve or it will stick up on each end. This is a 16 inch radius. I know that because it's a Martin and that's been that way for years. I have a 16 inch radius block. Radius blocks are used to true fretboards when you take the frets out and refret. Heck, if this guitar was a fret job or in my shop to have a bunch of pearls replaced, I'd be using a big radius block to sand them all at once and I'd see the radius come in. This is not the case when you have a one inlay between frets. I can't go in there and sand or file or scrape. It would be horrible. So I have to pre-radius the inlay blank. I'll be using a number of different grits with double stick tape on it to stick it to the radius block. And I'm going to start with 220. I could start with 120 if it was a bigger piece maybe, but you can lose a little color as you go through the layers of abalone. So I don't want to scratch it too deep. And I think for the small amount we need to take off that 220 is going to do it. I also put a fence on this, just a chunk of wood that I clamped at this end. Then I squared it up so that this block, when it rides along the fence, will always be on the center line. And we won't get a wonky, misshapen radius on it. I put the other scrap of inlay on here so this block won't rock on one little piece. I'm putting pencil on the top of this so I can see my progress. And I'm starting out with the 220 grit. It's going to take most off on the edges and that's going to happen pretty fast. See, I'd be rocking if I didn't have that scrap piece in there. Turn it around and get it'll load up both sides. Now I want to put some pencil marks on it and I'm going to switch to a different grit just in case I'm already where I want to be. 320. It's just a few strokes with each. It's not too early to check the radius. I'm going to use this little fret slot depth gauge. And this side is for a 15 to 20 inch radius and it happens to be 16 in the center. Wow, we could be there folks. So what I'll do is change right to a 400 and a 600 and start polishing it. I'm not trying to take any more off but shine what's there. I'll put a little pencil on it just to really be sure I'm taking pearl off everywhere. It's going to be pretty. Takes those marks right away. 600 next. Each time I do it, I'm still going to put a little pencil on it because that tells me I'm really taking it off evenly. Oh, it's looking good. Oh boy. This is 800. Even though I can almost stop at 800, I'm not going to. I'm going to go through 1,000, 1,200, 1,500, and 2,000 in this ultra-fine paper. Now this isn't a stick'em paper, so I'm folding it so I can grab that sandpaper as I move. It's really fine now. 1,200. 1,500, 2,000. Okay, I've sanded the abalone to the radius of the fingerboard, and now for the big moment. Let's test fit this and see how well we've done. Gosh, the height feels perfect. I don't think I'll even have to use a shim. It's flush to the wood around it. Your fingers are a really good testing device, believe me. It's just beautiful. And whatever glue I glue it in with will fill the little teeny cracks on the outside because there'll be black glue. Or I can put black powder in to any glue I want. I'm going to use a piece of paper towel and put a little polishing compound on it. I've chosen the medium because that's middle of the road. This will just put a nice shine on that abalone. It looks good. It's beautiful and ready to install. Okay, we've got the inlay polished and flush in the board and it's time to glue it in. And you have a lot of options when it comes to the glue to use. A standby is this two hour epoxy that mixes up jet black. In layers all over the world use that. Another glue would be super glue, the black one, because it is black. 
I'm not going to use these though because I can't wipe it with water. It's messy and it will stick to the wood. This one I would use if I were inlaying all these, making the guitar, let them dry, and then you sand it and polish it. So I'm going to use a water-based glue. Could be high glue. These are granules you mix yourself. Could be fish glue. That's a lot like high glue. And then you have tight bond. These are all water soluble and easier to clean up. Of the three, since I'm going to color this glue with this black powder, which is an inlay powder to color any kind of glue with, I don't want to use tight bond because it's creamy white and it would take a lot of powder to ever get a real black out of it. I think I'll use fish glue. Fish glue is already mixed. It's translucent. It doesn't take a lot of black to make it black. And the cleanup's easy. Since when I press this pearl down into the glue-filled cavity, it's going to ooze up through any fissures and cracks. Before I start, I'm going to tape off right up to the edge. That way, I can peel this off and take most of the excess glue with it. I'm going to mix my glue in my favorite mixing jars. It's the little package that your repair magnets come in. I've saved these for years. I probably have 40 or 50 of them because they're perfect little mixing cups. See, that'll be easy to turn black. I don't want so much that the hydraulic pressure would keep the pearl from going in. But there's enough gaps around the edges here that it, it'll squeeze out. This glue has a long open time. That's another reason I might not want to use high glue because it sets up very quickly, turns to a gel. Let me take a little out at the bottom. Okay. That's in. I'm going to get a little bit of water. Well, that tape didn't guard against all the glue, but that's okay. That's the advantage of using water-soluble glues. I'm just firmly pressing this down, getting a little squeeze out. I don't need a clamp although a clamp wouldn't hurt it. I'll take off some of the excess glue with a little cleaning swab, like that. Now I'll let this dry a few hours and come back with some hot water on a cloth and that'll come right off. Good morning. We're done here with this inlay on the D45. I hung around about an hour last night as that glue set a bit and gave her a good wipe down with hot water on a rag, damp, not soaking wet. Let it dry all night. And then I came in this morning and buffed it up with some 12,000 grit micro mesh. You know, it shines like all the others and it's looking beautiful. I love the way this came out. From the beginning we went through a nice little stack of abalone looking for one that looked like this because that's real abalone, that's real abalone, and I wanted this to match those three because they have these blues and reds, the beautiful little ribbon stripe, and it all worked out perfectly and I think that Rick's finally going to have his dream guitar. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and learned something. Don't forget, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It really does help us keep these videos coming your way. So long, see you next time.